So the Murdahl perspectives that were so beautifully presented to us um, by uh, 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 our three initial speakers, um, Francis's point about the need for multidisciplinarity and the need to focus to make sure that the assumptions are appropriate. And one that really came home to me working on the... Uh, the food price crisis in 2008. You know, a lot of people think of farmers as like farmers in Iowa or the UK, um, people who sell, produce and sell stuff. You know, people with a profit function but no expenditure function. Um, in many developing countries, many poor farmers are actually net buyers of food, you know, who are made worse off when the price goes up, not better off. You know, those sorts of changes of assumption and methodology, they're, they're really, really important, and it's in, very important to emphasize those. The historical legacies, really loved Ron's presentation um, of the historical legacies and what they've meant uh, for particularly the ethnic and, and religious diversity that came from the various conquests, you know, the, Mong the, the Mughal conquest of India, um, as well as the later colonial uh, experiences. Um, I, I wondered whether it would be useful to add one other big change there, which was the large-scale immigration um, out of southern China and the implications that that's had for many of the countries uh, in, in the region in terms of um, economic and social development. Um, and then uh, Koshik's wonderful discussion, democracy, governance, economic performance, which was really central to the paper, um, and, and then the, the, the importance of norms, uh, which he emphasised uh, in the presentation. I think your taxi driver analogy is wonderfully appropriate. The taxi driver who doesn't follow the norm of trade negotiations, for instance, where I offer to reduce my protection in return for a reduction in your protection. You see the taxi driver model emerge from the United States at the moment lower your protection or I'll raise my tariffs uh, on you. This norm-busting um, experience, I think, uh, is rather shocking uh, to, many, to many people. Um, what I wanted to do was to bring in a few tables, a few that I think generate, that, that, that generated some insights that weren't covered in the three presentations, although these overlap a little um, with Deepak's uh, very interesting observations. Um, in Asian drama, Murdahl talks a lot, and, and, and in a very depressing tone, in fact, about the, the problem of rapid population growth. As you know, populations were growing very, very rapidly. Countries were at a relatively early stage of the demographic transition in South and East Asia. Um, when he wrote, you had the fall in the death rates, but you still had um, very large um, very high fertility rates. You know, Bangladesh, you know, seven children per woman. Um, China, 6.4. Uh, India, five, nearly six. six. Six to seven was the... Now, that generates very, very rapid population growth, which was a source of great pessimism. Um, uh, uh, Murdahl, in particular, focused on the Philippines, where he felt that the Catholic Church was a major opponent uh, of of birth control, um, but move forward, uh, you know, the 50 odd years, and what do you see? Staggeringly low fertility rates in most, in most of the countries, net reproductive rates, 2.1 in Bangladesh, you know, 1.5 uh, in Thailand, a country where 33% of people are still engaged in agriculture, where children um, can generate returns relatively easily early by looking after small animals and so on. Uh, the Philippines is still something of an outlier, but at 2.9 children per woman rather than uh, uh, 6.8 um, 6 uh, as it was. So a dramatic change uh, there, um, which uh, I think, uh, about which he was perhaps too pessimistic. He was very pessimistic too about the grip of tradition, the resistance to education. If you look though at recent UNESCO figures, you see just staggering changes in many, in many countries. And here, this is kind of a lagging, you know, secondary, lower secondary school, the sort of level of education that if done right, gives confident literacy and numeracy. Um, uh, these rates have Im Im you know, improved immeasurably in Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, um, 
Kenya as an example, and then Nigeria as a counterexample, where there's been essentially uh, no progress, slower in Pakistan, but a real transformation um, of, of, uh, of the world. These are completion rates for a cohort, of course, so there's a lag. Um, another thing that uh, I think has been hugely important in the transformation of, of Asia um, and other developing countries is the, the innovation of high-yielding varieties. This has big implications for poverty, as Martin Revelian has shown in many, many, uh, many, many papers. Um, and agricultural output uh, per capita, I'm realizing I have a very old slide here, um, it actually took off uh, from about uh, the 1960s. Uh, apologies for that, as new varieties came on. And that, that gap, uh, you know, the growth rate, in developing countries has continued to be much higher of output per uh, capita than in the, develop than in the industrial countries. Um, here, I overlap um, with, with Deepak. This, this point between 1820 and 1990, if you look at developing countries as a whole, just a persistent pattern of much higher um, growth rates. We know from neoclassical economics that economic convergence ought to be the case, that a poor country can grow by adopting frontier level technology and then moving out as the frontier moves out, innovating in that way. So you would expect higher rates of economic growth, um, as Abramovitz and others pointed out after um, Murdahl wrote. Um, but in fact, we saw exactly the opposite. Growth rates much slower um, in the developing countries than in the rich countries um, from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. With the Madison data, uh, we can now see back uh, in ways um, that Murdahl uh, couldn't, couldn't at the time. And that growth rate difference, um, 1.6% per annum in per capita income uh, in the rich countries, 0.9% um, in other, uh, other countries, including Asian countries, that just created an ever-growing gap. And that gap continued to rise in aggregate up until uh, 1990, although, as, as Deepak pointed out, Asia started to move ahead um, earlier than, than, than the rest of the, of the developing uh, world. Um, and a consequence of this, much higher growth in developing countries from around 1990. Richard Baldwin has a very interesting thesis about convergence, economic convergence, and he makes the point that prior to, to the 90s, before you had the technology of communication and transport, if you wanted an industrial development and agglomeration, all of those gains, you had to build the entire industrial sector the way the traditional um, rich countries did. After that time, it's become possible to break up the production process. You don't need to do everything. In fact, you shouldn't do everything. You should use global value chains. You should do the things you're really good at, trade in tasks, and that that can give you. Um, and I think that's probably a very, very powerful part of this enormous gap um, in growth rates between rich and poor countries, which, as we'll see, if you look at the World Development Indicators numbers for that period, 91 to 2016, where was the growth very rapid? It was in China, it was in India, it was in other East Asia, to a smaller degree in other South Asia. Um, and the other developing country regions more or less kept up rather than surged ahead. But at least keeping up was a big progress relative to early periods. So Asian transformations, to summarise, leaving a little time for discussion, Asia has been transformed since Murdahl wrote, some of the areas of great concern to Murdahl have turned out well. Demography and population growth, total change in the picture. Education and economic dynamism, Murdahl was very pessimistic, as Francis pointed out, about the um, uh, ad adaptability and enthusiasm for change um, of the general population. Uh, he seems to have been way too conservative. I think agricultural productivity is another area where he was way too conservative. That's been a real uh, engine uh, of change. And then, of course, with new data, we can see not just, for, well, we can't, still can't see very well forward, but we can see a lot better um, going back and see a lot of things that weren't visible um, in Murdahl's time. Thank you very much, Bill, for the wonderful job in discussing of a vast expanse. Uh, <coughs> that is Asia over 50 years. Uh, we started about five minutes late, so we certainly have about 10, 12 minutes. Uh, not enough. 
Uh, and if we don't have time to answer all your questions, we'll try and take them on board in, in what we write. So may I invite any questions that people have? Knut Tonstad from uh, Norad. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, uh, that um, there are different paths uh, to development, and you mentioned that in Korea and uh, the province of Taiwan, uh, they relied on uh, their own technology. But uh, I recently read uh, Amsten's book about um, Asia's next giant that details that the industrial development in, in Korea. And she points out uh, the, the huge imports of machinery, blueprints, uh, licenses, and, uh, and uh, also patents from, from the West, and also excursions by Koreans to the West, and, and, and vice versa. So in the early stages, there were huge imports of uh, technology uh, financed by very rapid export growth, I think. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I, we'll, we'll come around. Let's take the questions. Uh, Stephanie, and then I will come back to you last, Andy. Excellent panel. Uh, just two brief comments. One, I very much liked uh, the point that Francis made about Indian economists already early in the 20th century stressing the specificities of, of their economies. Um, and a similar thing, also very rarely quoted, happened in Latin America particularly after the Second World War. And actually, Dudley Sears, who you mentioned, was one of the few exceptions who was sensitive and, in fact, disseminated a lot of thinking of, of Latin American economists. Uh, my other point was also to Francis. I think you very rightly point to the fact that economic interests of the West influenced their thinking, and you listed their free trade. And what is interesting now is that free trade particularly from Trump, but more generally, uh, is not a leading aim of the developed economies, and perhaps partly because it doesn't suit their interests, or partly because of different ideological perceptions. So, yes. Thank you. Yes? Thank you for the wonderful presentations. My name is Elena, and my question is to Professor Stewart. So basically, you mentioned that the values should be considered locally, but not from the elite decision makers. So could you say your opinion of how those like local values can be gathered together to get that understanding? And also, you talked about the interdisciplinary analysis. So it uh, would be interesting to hear what disciplines do you consider to be added to economical analysis. Thank you. Economics embedded in, uh, in social sciences and embedded in history. That's a good start for thinking about Asian transformation. Um, economics is also embedded in the natural sciences. I thought it was great that you started us out on your journey uh, by thinking about the river valleys in the region. The end of the journey at the moment for many Asians is air that they can't breathe respiratory disease, uh, high, ex excessive levels of, of air pollution. And the big transformation on the agenda in Asia right now, I think, is, is how to uh, provide uh, power for these massive cities, uh, which does not lead to uh, continued uh, excessive emissions of, of, greenhouse gas em of greenhouse gases. None of you have mentioned the Asian environment beyond the river valleys. And I think it's very important if you're looking at Asian transformation um, to, to take some of those factors into consideration when you, when you publish your study. Otherwise, you're slightly missing the mark. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Tadessa from Ethiopia, and I'd like to congratulate all presenters for wonderful work they have made. My question is issue of uh, leadership in the Asian transformation process. I hope uh, the underlining fact and the major bottom line for all progress is issue of leadership. So uh, can't you see that is uh, something different compared to many other developing countries in terms of institutional arrangement and quality of leadership, which has made all these whatever promotion of development, whether education, trade, whatever you said, is uh, somehow led by leadership. It's quality of leadership. So could you explain what, what, what values or uh, norms that contribute to have 
high level quality leadership in the Asian development process. Andy. Hi, thanks. That's a really interesting set of presentations. Uh, two questions. The first is, I was wondering, what do you think the story, and the story still for developing countries, is a, is a dependence on global patterns in the global economy? If you think of Indonesia and Malaysia, the, you know, there was a first wave on global prices for commodities, oil in particular, in the 60s and 70s. Then that was replaced by uh, uh, relative exchange rates and uh, interest rate differentials drove the kind of 19, the, the mid 80s to the mid 90s story. So I wonder, I mean, do we need to look again at things like structuralism and the kind of, I mean, we're, we're, we're sort of doing my favorite thing of, of dig, digging up dead economists, which is uh, one of my, my sidelines and hobbies. Uh, and so, um, as, as, I'm, as, as uh, I will be one day. <laughs> so maybe I hope I'll get dug up perhaps. Um, and then the so, the, so do we need to look again about the, is there a dependency on the global economy that we just don't take enough account of? You know, if you look at Southeast Asia, clearly that you could say, I mean, one, one way is, is, is calling it serendipity, you know, Indonesia, Malaysia, natural resource, oil boom in the 70s, uh, big interest rates, differentials, drove the manufacturing relocation from Northeast Asia, uh, the Plaza Accord, interest rate differentials, that drove a second phase. So probably, but perhaps with Southeast Asia in mind, uh, you know, to what extent is development ever dependent on global accumulation? Um, and then the second question is, um, Deepak, in one of your slides, I, I, I was trying to work it out, but it went too quickly. Was the expansion of Asia at, at the expense of other developing countries or at the expense of the West? My read of your slide was actually, it was at the expense of other developing countries. And so maybe that brings, if you look at the percentages, not entirely, but slightly. I mean, the kind of expansion of it to whatever it was, 29% of global GDP. So maybe Asia expanded uh, at the cost of other developing countries. And it brings me back to the, the, you know, the idea at the moment is it's becoming much harder for countries to achieve economic development because manufacturing's been getting spread thinner and thinner between more and more countries. Uh, and that pushes you into questions, you know, the prospects for, for, for service-led development, you know, how real are they? So kind of, um, those are my questions, thank you. You have politics and different groups with different interests within each country. So I spoke in a very crude way about the interests of the West, but different groups within the West have different views. And you can see this going back say, to the Corn Law debate, where it was the manufacturers wanted the free entry of agricultural products and the others didn't. I think now we're coming to a sort of new turning point where there are large elements of unskilled workers in our countries for whom free trade is a real threat. And that's turning up in the politics. And we see that in Trump and we see that in Brexit. And then it gets translated into new interests. So I think it's, yeah, still the case, obviously. Well, economists haven't caught up with Trump. We don't have, you, you know, you and I have been arguing that certain countries should have protection, but not the West. Um, economists, it's not the economic policies, it's just the poli it's not the economists who are advocating it, it's just the policy makers at the moment, but it's obviously, they, they will probably come and uh, rationalize this. Um, how to get at values is a really interesting issue because, um, well, because there's heterogeneity of values, and that's back to the point I just made, you can't assume that if you wanted local values, even within a village, the women and the men may have different views, people of different age groups may have different views. So there is a huge problem of condensing that into any single set of priorities, but there's also a problem of ascertaining what the values were. I've just been at a conference where they had smartphones and all the audience could just vote on values. I loved it. You suddenly saw your views up there, you know, what, what was the values. I think that is beginning, because of course smartphones are spreading like wildfire, is going to be the beginning of a very good way of getting at values, but we will still always have the problem of heterogeneity of values and how to solve that, and, and I can't solve it, it's political. Um, on the interdisciplinary issue, I think my own experience is that you really need to um, educate people at the undergraduate and graduate level, not just on the importance of interdisciplinarity, but actually multidisciplinary education. Because starting from that, 
then people prepared to understand it and um, talk to people from different disciplines and incorporate it. But if you have pe people educated, say, purely in economics, and more and more it's very, very specialized and they're not learning other disciplines, then it's a huge task to try and get multidisciplinarity uh, to work. Let me just comment on um, two points or questions that were raised. Um, uh, the um, uh, air pollution and environment uh, that, that was uh, mentioned, actually the importance of that to me, the most striking is um, civilizations have collapsed in the past and that Indus Valley civilization is a great example. When we were growing up, the story used to be that the Indus Valley civilization collapsed because the Aryans had mastered the control of the horse and it was repeat small attacks that made it go down. But Throughout, there was a bit of a mystery as to how it went down. There is now overwhelming evidence, and there's a lot of research at Yale and Cornell, digging literally and getting evidence out, that the main reason why the civilization collapsed was they didn't realize the amount of environmental damage that they were doing. Water tables dropping, and they just didn't have the wherewithal, the scientific wherewithal to appreciate that. And that's worth reminding that there can be very different reasons and pollution and air quality can be a reason why we can decimate uh, uh, growth and development. Certainly something to be kept in mind. And I'm just turning to Andy, your remark about um, manufacturing to uh, services. Uh, um, it is true that thanks to technological uh, progress, manufacturing is taking in fewer and fewer labor. It's, there's still manufactured products, but machines are beginning to do that. To that, my, uh, I have two responses. One is, you may be right, that there will be uh, greater stress in services, and we are already beginning to see trends in that. Also, it could be that what constitutes economic growth, the constituents could change dramatically. And after all, that has happened through history. I mean, Earlier it was grain and food, but since then it moved to, to cars and <coughs> vacations. It could move, for instance, to health. The scope for health improvement can be just huge, the human capacity, quality of life that you lead. And there can be a disproportionate amount of human effort going into that, prolonging a long, a longevity, etc. And yet another thing has to be kept in mind that if in the end, Machines do, machines and artificial, uh, artificial intelligence manages to take over production virtually everything, even in services. That in itself is not really the end of the world. As long as the surplus that is being generated by what the machines are producing are not, is not cornered by a small segment of the population. What we then need is an ownership of profit and rental income, which will become the bulk of the global income that is much more thinly spread across the population so that we can spend time on art, music, literature, philosophy, and machines and robotic um, creatures produce all the goods that we need. That's a possibility, but our attention has to turn then to the distribution of the rent that comes out of these activities. Just, just, just very briefly, and the point about globalization, I think globalization could be destroyed the same as it was in 1914, after 1914, um, but I think it's much less likely. The globalization breaking up into bits, most of the trade now is in components. The interest groups want that trade. Um, you know, so it's only people you know, like the taxi driver um, who, have, who are unaware of economics and unwilling to follow norms who are pushing uh, to to com to completely um, you know destroy that system, but a, a country that produces its phones domestically, the iPhones if they're all produced in the United States, they won't be competitive. The only way they will then need protection, it'll just be an endless round of protection until Manmohan Singh's 150 percent tariff is uh, realised in the United States. I, I, I don't think it's going to happen. We have overrun our time. I will be very brief and address three questions that were not addressed. First, Korea and Taiwan, it is true that in the early stages they imported technologies, but without the capital, with licensing, fees, and royalties. But the objective always was to develop domestic technological capabilities in, in, in Korea and in Taiwan. Uh, it is true that Asia has, in the past 30 years particularly, uh, derived enormous benefit from the process of globalization. And 
the booms in the world economy, uh, although some of Asia has been hurt by the bust as well. Uh, but we do need to recognize that Asia on its own with its rising incomes is now a large part of the world market and it has a capacity to sustain uh, some of that growth on the demand side. Asia has grown largely at the expense of industrialized countries, whether in GDP or in manufacturing value added. Uh, Africa has regressed just a little, uh, but not that much. Uh, and Latin America uh, has fluctuated, but it's roughly where it was in the world economy. So it is largely at the expense of industrialized countries and partly at the expense of transition economies. Um, I think the question about, uh, there are two questions about the future, essentially. Uh, one is that this fossil fuel-based industrialization is not going to be sustainable and in which direction is Asia going to move uh, to green technologies, to different products, uh, to a new role for services, all are possibilities, uh, but certainly it could grind to a halt if it's fossil fuel based because the, the, the climate change has become a serious threat. Uh, and, and last but not least, I want to say that yes, uh, you know, the role of the state is in part about the role of leadership. But what the experience of Asia tells us is that despite enormous variance, variations in the nature of governments and the nature of politics, uh, which I described in terms of uh, very, very different setups, uh, every state has in, in its own way, but differently, supported that process of development. Uh, and that is the diversity of Asia. Uh, it is not about individual leaders, not necessarily. Perhaps Lee Kuan Yew or Park Chung Hee, but not that much. It is about the, the, the process of, of, of government and politics in Asia. Uh, but how it will survive uh, the spread of political democracy is an important question, because much of Asia is still characterized by authoritarian regimes. But there are the beginnings of more democracy. Uh, let me with this thank you for your patience. We took longer than we should have and thank the panelists for their presentations. Thank you.